Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I see we've, we've just hit one o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, want to thank you for joining us today uh, for our last webinar of 2016. That is so hard to believe. Um, we've had a great year of uh, lots of lots of awesome content, um, and uh, hopefully, you know, if you haven't. Uh, been able to to see all of them live you've been able to check the recordings um, we've done you know everything from lubrication to electrical to you know business management topics at the internet of things last month um, so uh, I think it's been a pretty pretty cool year and uh, we're really excited to have um, Robbie with us from Nissan to kind of talk us through sort of the evolution of, of ultrasound at Nissan um, so it's kind of fun to end with a, a customer and to sort of hear their their backstory and, and the lessons they've learned along the way and um, should be a great webinar for everybody um, and a great uh, kind of topper to uh, 2016. Um, just some housekeeping before we turn things over to Robbie. Um, I am recording this, so this will go up on our website with, with the rest of the webinars that we've done this year than all the previous years, so lots of information up there. Um, you also do have the ability to ask questions, and we encourage that. You can just type those in, and I'll be keeping an eye on those, and I'll get those questions over to Robbie. Um, definitely by the end of the session, if not, uh, maybe even sometimes peppered throughout if it makes sense. So um, feel free to toss those questions our way. Um, and, you know, if we do have any technical issues, um, that sometimes happens on these things. That's kind of the... the uh, deal with doing these live but uh, just bear with us we'll get things sorted out as quick as we can um, but it, it is fun to be able to sort of come together and, and be on this thing uh, with folks throughout the the country um, uh, once a month so uh, bear with us if we have any of that but hopefully not and with that I'm going to turn the screen over to Robbie and let him get started Okay, this is this right, Maureen? Can you see it? Yep, we're seeing it. Let's see. Do I need to get rid of this? No, we can't see that, but if you can minimize that if you want. That's the little menu is just on okay. your screen. Yep. Okay. All right. Um let me go back here. There we go. Uh well, my name is Robbie, as Maureen introduced me. Uh, this is, uh, I work for Nissan. I'm a PDM technologist for, for Nissan, and I've been uh, working for Nissan for a little, about 14 years now. Uh, Nissan's a very large company, as you see here. They've got a very big footprint in the, in the United States, uh, in multiple locations. Uh, our plant is right here uh, in Canton, Mississippi. Uh, the you, the picture doesn't really do it justice, but it's about a mile. Our plant is about a mile long and and she well over half a mile wide, nearly a nearly a mile wide. It's nearly as wide as it is long, uh, and it's anyway. It's very large. There are lots and lots of different assets in this plant. Uh, we have uh, Smyrna plant is even larger than ours and then Decker which is there they build our engines um, Smyrna plant does more or less the same thing as what we do and then we have the offices headquarters and testing facilities there's but uh, just to give you a an idea our property size is 1100 acres uh, we employ more than 6,000 people at our plant and the facility is uh, 4.2 million square feet uh, and it's growing uh, there's even larger than that now this is this is kind of old old stuff uh, the model vehicles we build are Murano, Altima, the NV van, the Frontier, uh, and the new Titan, which is 
if nobody's looked at it or if nobody's seen that thing yet, it's quite impressive and there's more options. That Cummins diesel engine is quite it's you know, it's quite the hoss. So if you need a good truck, that's the one. But all right, enough of the Nissan stuff. This is our uh, our PDM progression kinda. Overall, we started out doing PDM here basically with me and shortly after me there was a, a one more person and another part of the plant and paint that got involved and between the two of us we started out doing ultrasound right off the bat uh, that was that was where we cut our teeth and it's uh, we started out and collected got together between the both of us about 3500 points uh, uh, that we checked in just two parts of the, just two areas of the plant um, and then we slowly moved on to infrared and got another got another 2500 points of that mechanical infrared uh, so we were basically following up ultrasound routes with infrared uh, which most of the time uh, doesn't work out too well I mean it, it works out but most of the time infrared is not going to find anything because if there's if there's problems ultrasound's going to pick it up way ahead of time but it's funny what peripheral stuff you can pick up uh, problems that you're not checking with ultrasound with the infrared just by being in that area uh, anyway there was there was a there was a reason for for following following up the ultrasound routes with the infrared uh, let's see over here this is a uh, we started with the GMR manager, PDM supervisor, a, me, and the guy from Paint. Like I, like I said, um, and we started getting some training. We got a we got a motor motor analyzer. Uh, let's see, vibration routes were being done by contractor Yates inside inside the plant. Uh, and our oil analysis was non-existent pretty much at the time uh, and upper management really had no clue as to what we were what we were trying to do or or the benefits of it um, now in 2016 we have well over 6,000 points uh, and on 150 routes, infrared is 5,000 points. Electrical, we're uh, it, it, it's a huge amount of points, and we're steadily building on this because parts of our plant are not um, body shop, for instance. Basically, they've just gotten started at this, um, and paint they are they're they're well developed paint the paint department is well developed in ultrasound and infrared but they are uh, they have different equipment their their equipment is high speed equipment and I'll get into that a lot of their equipment is very high speed stuff so uh, I'll get into that a little bit later um, let's see our vibration is still most is mostly done in-house contractor by Yates. Still, we have just purchased a new uh, uh, vibration tool, uh, and we haven't started doing that really yet. Paint has started playing with it some, but we're we're going to build into vibration. Um, let's see, we have started building our motor analysis database. To get started with motor analysis heavily, uh, and our oil analysis now we do have a, our equipment has been repaired and updated. It has not we do not have the newest uh, analyzer yet, but we're but at least we're able to get business done mostly in house, but we do send some outside also. Uh, upper management is now supporting our PDM efforts. And the PDMs we have we have a 
PDM supervisor, three PDM technologists, eight PDM techs, and two reliability engineers. Uh, so our department is, you know, our GMR office is growing. Uh, and we have lots of training and sir as a matter of fact UE systems is in our plant right now giving a level one course uh, okay ultrasound by far is our largest uh, PDM technology that we're that we use uh, it's the quickest to set up it's the it's one of the it's a relatively easy to learn there are lots of things to learn about it don't get me wrong but it's relatively easily easy compared to uh, the analysis that has to be done with a lot of other technologies uh, there's a lot of tricks to it though uh, like this right here some you know most of the time we just go around and we mark our points with the uh, with a paint pen where we're or paint marker or something like that or or a use a center punch or something where we're going to be checking our taking our readings every time well a lot of stuff like this motor is difficult to get to it's behind screen guards or behind a light curtain or anything uh, under the floor so you have to get kind of creative uh, we have put grommets uh, or cut holes and put grommets in this screen guard to where we're checking the same points every time same locations every time but uh, the rubber insulates from picking up any any noise off of this off of the screen guard and at the same time we're all, we're also following Roche, uh, OSHA guidelines with these holes too there's certain size holes that you can have for the distance the equipment is away from the screen guard and stuff so so those OSHA guidelines also need to be followed for stuff like this all right uh, we have installed I don't know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, RAS remote access sensors for ultrasound um, and we're steadily installing more and there's many reasons why uh, but uh, one of them is safety of course uh, these RAS sensors are can be placed in areas where there are potential hazards or uh, with collecting data using the standard modules uh, you know uh, there's you want a, a lot of there's moving equipment everywhere in this plant so you you know any place that you have a something's moving you want to be able to keep your eyes on what's around you rather than keeping your eye down you know having your head bent over or something like that trying to get, take a reading on a piece of equipment well if you install these sensors you can have the box or a collection box up in an area to where you're looking at you're looking at everything that's going on around you so it's a lot safety is the number one reason or one of the number one reasons why we install these things uh, inaccessible areas uh, we have lots of equipment that's inside cages behind guarding under floors uh, and that that's that's one of the primary reasons a lot of you know extremely uh, critical equipment are in bad locations where we can't get to them during production so these RAS sensors come in very very handy for that uh, reliability this is something that some people don't think about I guess whenever they're getting these things uh, once they're installed you know they don't move so it's guaranteed that the data is going to come from the same location or the same position every reading uh, where if a, if it's a person that's doing it they may change the position of the of the of the stethoscope or move it over a half an inch or something like that that might make a difference in those readings uh, a you know a RAS ensures that the data will not be affected due to the pressure or angle at which an operator holds the ultras ultrasound probe well a lot of our readings most of them actually we use the uh, stethoscope so according to how hard you press 
that stethoscope down or the angle at which you hold that stethoscope could be an issue as far as getting readings go and we like our readings to be as good I mean I say good as linear as possible without being erratic you know from uh, two or three months you know if you take a reading every three months you don't want one reading to be uh, way high and the next reading to be way low and the next reading to be way high again we you want it to be more or less linear and show a steady show a steady increase or decrease or something if you're lubricating it uh, that's the whole uh, so position and pressure does matter and these RAS sensors take that variable away from it uh, time consolidating these points into one spot saves time and steps so it also so therefore it speeds up the routes um, which helps whenever you have as many points as we have every few minutes that you can save helps <clears throat> cost they're relatively inexpensive um, especially considering the downtime that can that it can cost in our plant uh, we've started we have started with the most critical assets of course and and consider that and safety and other things but that's I mean we, we make our decision based on you know there's a series of thought going behind it it's not just we just we, we don't just pull it out of thin air where we're going to put these things so here's a note one thing that <clears throat> UE system sells uh, these RAS sensors with uh, either no cable 8 foot 25 or 50 foot cables um, well we have purchased and tested install and installed 100 foot cables with success so we haven't tried any longer than that and I do not recommend using a uh, union to tie cables together um, but if you get a solid good quality cable we have used we have installed 100 foot cables and have let, had every, none of them have been well we haven't even had a two decibel drop over 100 feet uh, and that's comparing it directly comparing that reading directly to hooking up hooking up with the RAS directly so we haven't even had a two decibel drop over 100 feet so they work it works well at 100 feet too so I would uh, not be afraid to use that all right here's a a typical remote sensor installation uh, we have the box outside the cage right here where we can collect the data and uh, we have uh, the we name our points different uh, a lot of people a lot of people call them inboard and outboard and uh, that kind of thing that's that comes that's vibration terminology more or less but we came up I I just like the gearbox input gearbox output motor front motor rear terminology but that's typical is we we like to check the input of the gearbox the output of the gearbox uh, the motor front bearing and the motor rear so that's our typical stuff uh, sometimes we have a there is a I don't know if you can see my mouse here but there is a cyclo pointer or a cyclo section in between this motor and gearbox that we also check on you know on certain piece of equipment we check it also but that's just a typical sensor example uh, here is a, another location picture is not all that great but uh, we install the plugs up here it's just a it's just a flat plate and we've installed all these plugs and these plugs are going to these motors going across this is a this is a seat conveyor and we can't get to these things while it's running um, at all this is open floor and stuff in between here and anyway so we can't get to them so we have three sensors on these uh, 
going across and, and there's three there's a third motor over here so there's uh, so we have three sensors per per motor so um, now here is one that's a, a turntable so one trick that we've learned is that these cables do not work too well inside of cat track so if you have cable tray flexible cable tray or cat track uh, these cables tend to grip other wires and cables that might be in there and as it's moving they these cables pull and they'll pull loose from the RAS sensors or they'll break the RAS sensors off of a gearbox or a motor or you know something to where you have to go back and repair it so what we have done is instead of running it through the cable tray and bringing the box out here somewhere out out on the, out in the open uh, we leave the box on here on the turntable uh, where you can still have your head up you can attach we attach a short cable to this and we just walk with the turntable you walk with your head up to where you're seeing what's going on so we're eliminating we're eliminating uh, unless you trip over your own feet where you know we eliminate all the safety issues here uh, so here it is you connect the cable to the J box and see yep collect the data while the turntable is in motion because right now if it's just sitting still the motors not even on but as soon as it starts rolling then then we can get our data which is which this is a uh, much better than I say much better it's different anyway I can't say one technology is better than the other but it's different from vibration where it has to be running for a certain length of time before you can really get any information uh, ultrasound works almost immediately um, see yeah here it is short cable allows for the tech to be clear of the turntable while it's in motion uh, and then just connect to the next point between between cycles all right uh, body shop this is one of the areas that I was talking about earlier they uh, are everything in body shop in our in our plant is inside cages or in extremely difficult places you can't get to do and it's all due to robotic automation and in, in body shops there everything is inside a cage to where because all equipment is moving automatically all all the time and a robot just doesn't care if you're in the way so we uh, so everything is in cages to where you can't get to it so we have to put sensors on things and bring the boxes outside so we can collect our data uh, safely and uh, we can also watch the equipment at the same time to see see if it's go see what's going on body shop is only about uh, shoot I can show you uh, body shop is only about an 60 65 percent complete so we still have a lot of work to do in body shop to get everything that we've identified to get it all monitored with ultrasound uh, here's another location in body shop this shows the RAS shows the RAS sensors over here on the motor gearbox pillow block bearings uh, this is just another area where the motor is pretty much more or less inaccessible you have to crawl over a lot of moving equipment to be able to get to it so it's unsafe to get to really while production's running so uh, if you don't like those multi-port boxes uh, that what I what I what I call multi-port boxes here are uh, switch boxes that uh, this is one this four port switch right here on the on the left is one that I bought a long time ago well actually I didn't it was a man I worked with but still we bought it off of Amazon uh, and installed it and that was I'm not sure if that was think that might have been before UE systems came up with this good box or I can't remember 
one, but the, I think one of the reasons why we got it was because this one is four ports uh, compared to the UE Systems eight port. So, uh, and all I needed was four ports at the time. So, anyway, regardless, you can see that this box is pretty, pretty well, pretty, pretty cheap. But it's lasted. It's it's actually worked. But its configuration only allows for it to be mounted in a certain way and in certain places, where where the UE Systems box is very heavy duty made, and it's also can be mounted on a screen guard or pretty much wherever. It's 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 definitely definitely better. But regardless, this one's that, that this one still does work. So in certain areas, these these switch boxes work out pretty well. Uh, in our paint department, we have a lot of very high speed fans and other equipment. Uh, the, for some reason, in paint with this very high speed stuff that they have, we have had issues with uh, our ultrasound data going up and down, up and down, and according to who might be taking the readings, how they might be taking the readings. There's a lot of variables in there, plus the plus the real very high speed stuff. For some reason, it, it's kind of erratic. Uh, we have started using these uh, steel discs. They're 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 magnetic, so we epoxy them down, and we've been using uh, we've been using Loctite. Loctite 330 adhesive, which is a two-part that's got an activator, a spray activator, and it seems to be working real well, transmits sound, uh, but these are like for on these round round surfaces, you can put this on here and uh, and it is a good flat, it's now a good flat surface for this, this uh, it's now a good flat surface for the magnet for whenever you're check, taking ultrasound readings with the magnet. So uh, no matter what position the magnet's in, as long as it's on that flat, as long as it's on that flat disc, you're going to get a good stable reading. So it eliminates, it helps eliminate uh, highs and lows and gives you more of that, more of that linear reading over time that I'm that I was that I'm talking about, uh, that or that I've mentioned. This disc back here on the rear, on the motor rear, is uh, it's mounted on the on the bolt. By the way, it's not just mounted on that cover. It is mounted on the bolt, and and the bolt is is locked down and locked down tight. So uh, there is good readings coming off of that. Uh, let's see, it's good for high speed applications. At us, yep. Solid flat surface. I forgot I had these bullet points here. Um, yeah, assist in stabilizing the DB readings. Um, oh yeah, there's another point. Can be center punched or drilled for use with the set with the stethoscope because we're doing that also for certain certain areas. We have a lot of areas where we have to mount these things where the fin, you know, over over two fins right there and block off the air passage right there uh, in that one spot so we can so we drill and center punch these things or center punch them for the stethoscope so it can be used there rather than trying to put the stethoscope down through here where air passage or anything else can can interfere or can add to the ultrasound readings uh, yeah, a rotary tool and Loctite 330 works well for this for the installation. Use a rotary tool to clean off the paint in that area real quick, and that Loctite 330 sets up pretty fast. All right, all this data that we're collecting, uh, I mean, we've got a huge database uh, full of stuff. Whenever I first started trying to organize this stuff it this is kind of what I did I put it all on a spreadsheet 
manually. I went through DMS and basically I manually entered every alarm, everything into and all the equipment into a spreadsheet like this. This spreadsheet was huge. Uh, I manually entered it. Uh, it was extremely time consuming, of course. Uh, it's hard, you know, imagine trying to go through this and figure out what's an alarm, what dropped out of alarm, putting notes on here. Um, and you don't know why it went out of alarm. It just next reading it was out of alarm. So you don't know uh, unless you unless you had a note on here saying that you told them degrees of bearing, then you don't even know why it went out of alarm next time. Uh, and this spreadsheet right here was nearly 400 lines long, so it was it was huge. Uh, I've tried to, I've been making some changes, so I automated that. Uh, now I use the uh, the alarm report in DMS, and I've create and we've created a uh, uh, spreadsheet that with with using VBA to it pulls the alarm reports. I store all the alarm reports from DMS into a single file and it automatically looks in the VBA code looks for that looks for those files and pulls them into this one spreadsheet right here. So I've got air, all of these points in a in a single single location. Um, saves a lot of time during data entry, but the report is still very long. Uh, and the alarms can still, from one month or from one quarter or however long, however often you pull this report, uh, from one quarter to another, alarms can appear or disappear accordingly. I, you know, you, and you don't know why. Uh, like, like this pre-evac, pre-evac vacuum pump right there. It could be a high alarm this month, and then three months from now, whenever you run whenever you're running again, it could be gone and you don't know why. So you have to go investigate and find out why, uh, you know, they, they may have replaced that, they may have replaced that thing or, you know, if I wrote a work order on it, then they definitely replaced it. So that might very well be a, a reason why it dropped out of alarm. Uh, this one is now once I, uh, this previous screen, uh, I I went even farther. I went, I took this screen and I and I used Access, Microsoft Access to uh, pull nothing but my high alarm. So I need to find out what uh, I needed to find out what exactly needed to be worked on right at that time. So and uh, I, I want to know what all those, what all that data boils down to, basically. So this uh, spreadsheet right here is what it. This is the query that I created and moved it into Excel, and so it it breaks, basically tells me where everything that's in high alarm. I made my comments out here. I need to find out, you know. I need to verify that these are still problems. That it wasn't just a fluke. That they they got a high they got a high reading. So I make notes out here whether or not they should. Uh, you know these these readings need to be verified before work order is written. Um, so of course I've written work orders on these things now, but everything has been verified. Uh, some of these uh, are false alarms. Like uh, RS60 and RS62 over here, those were false alarms. They uh, they were the motors had been replaced, um, and new readings were taken, but they weren't marked in DMS as uh, new baselines. So, and the previous readings also have to be deleted, so you don't get false alarms popping up on this report, but. Uh, so some of this is the sheet right here 
that I use to work out everything before I actually write the work orders, before I actually write work orders for the shops to repair things. Uh, see, yep, now, alarms are imported into Access from Excel and queries created to pull out the high alarms. So this is stuff that I need to respond to immediately. And high alarms are exported into Excel spreadsheet, this one. Uh, and this is where I, this is where everything gets resolved before I write it, write out work orders. Uh, and this spreadsheet is also available for PDM management to see, so they can see what's being done, what needs to be done, uh, and make sure things get done. So so we get this so we can get this equipment fixed and verify that there's a problem first, and then get it fixed. Uh, this is a what we call the PDM watch list, and uh, it's this one. This sheet, this sheet, excuse me, is verified or is seen by everybody. Uh, seen by the shops, uh, by the PDM guys that are doing it to show that show them that I'm writing work orders on, or that work orders are getting getting written on the on the problems that they found. Um, it's you know the, the the managers maintenance managers can see it uh, yeah all equipment work orders written uh, concerning problems with PDM technology go on this list so this is also for us for for the PDM people for, for PDM people to be able to keep up with what has been done so uh, whenever they're completed they're marked as complete over here and uh, whenever that once once they're completed it tells us whether or not say uh, they lubricate these bearings then and that's completed once that's completed then we go out there and we can recheck it uh, we recheck that component um, if they replace that motor and gearbox, we go back out there and get new baselines if we if we need to. Uh, and this also keep, like I said, this this shows the this is part of the way we show the value for our work. For for the for this this list is not for just ultrasound. This list is for infrared and for for motor analysis or Anything else that we do, any any other tools that we use, that everything goes on this list that that we've written work orders on. Uh, of course, you have to have a process for all of this for for problems that we found, um, how we move from one point to the next. You know, after after we detect uh, from the time we detect a problem to to validating the work and it's done. Everything's everything's completed. Uh, PF risk is removed. So, and whose responsibility each thing is. Now, this list for us has changed. Our process has changed a little bit. Uh, so I need to I need to tweak this process flow. But this thing does help you stay on track. So it helps you make sure that you cover all your bases and that all the so it might seem like it's a it's kind of a, a management tool and it kind of is but it's also a tool for for people like me that actually have their feet on the floor it actually helps me make sure I cover all my bases and everything you know I don't forget a step okay here are some of the finds uh, that I've had, and I, there's kind of a reason why I'm why why I have these slides. Uh, this is a overhead conveyor chain that uh, I found. Well, it's been a little while. Been a little while now. About shoot, I guess it's been nearly a year now. Uh, but this is one. This is one of the ones that we found with data. This thing went up. Uh, real fast. I mean, it went from one reading to the next. I mean, from 
from low, nearly low alarm to to high alarm extremely fast uh, within four months time and you know this is normally something that I, well it is it's something that I questioned I asked them I mean they they verified the readings on this thing just to make sure you know, uh, make sure there's actually uh, there's actually two two readings up here on the uh, but they're they but they well it's not recorded here but still they I did ask them to verify this reading um, and they did they verified it so something changed real fast inside inside that motor uh, this this is the front motor bearing so I I couldn't take a chance because it was an overhead conveyor overhead conveyor chain which will shut down our whole plant our whole trim department uh, for hours. Uh, so after the replacement over here, with that, they they did replace that drive, uh, and uh, about I think it was about 36 hours or something like that, or 24 hours or something after it was replaced. I took another reading on it, and it dropped the decibel levels dropped down to on that motor front it dropped down to uh, about 22 and a half DB uh, and then after it had run in pretty good this is this is the drive but after it had run in about four about no here it is about 36 hours uh, after it's been run in and loaded loaded down and put in it in its normal operation uh, it dropped all the way back down to baseline uh, I mean, it couldn't have been any more picture picture perfect than that. You can see this is on here uh, on this gearbox. You can see a couple of our points marked on it, uh, where this is where we're checking the gearbox gear, output output on both ends of the gearbox right there. So, uh, but there we have more more marks back here also, but. You can see a couple of them. This is how most of our points in, in our plant are marked, but the RAS sensors are, as I mentioned earlier, are getting spread even more widely because of just because of repeatability. Uh, you're not you're you're the, you're taking the variance out of it. Uh, these these reports like this uh, are what I send to uh, maintenance management or you know to to basically to my immediate management and maybe another level above that uh, but they they get this they see this they see they see the charts where you know where we made a after we replaced a, a piece of equipment or after we replaced a drive or something and we I mean I can show them exactly what ultrasound found where we found it and what happened after the drive was replaced um, what you know so I can prove I show them I prove to them that there's been that there was a problem I use our CMMS to figure out how long uh, how long the repair took and Use that time, and uh, and of course, finance in our plant gives us numbers uh, for an amount per for for downtime that we norm that some places you know it's, uh, I don't know some some plants don't have that capability, but uh, or don't, don't they don't have that, uh, but our finance gives us numbers how much how much it costs per minute for our plant to be down and or for our line to be down so it didn't take long for it doesn't take long in our plant for a uh, motor or gearbox that will stop a whole assembly line to add up so that one find right there was three hundred eighty four thousand dollars that it would have I and mean, that's cost avoidance time you know that uh, you can't really say it's cost savings it's just cost avoidance it's money that we would have spent if we hadn't have been able to find it. Uh, here's another one. Uh, 
sometimes, you know, I don't know. Even, as long as I've as long as I've been doing this now, I've been doing this for several, you know, for for a few years now, ultrasound, and you still question a lot of times. Um, so it's fun to it's interesting to take apart something that's not going to be sent necessarily going to be sent for repair, but take apart just to see what you found. Uh, and uh, this particular one right here, uh, you can see. The, well, I had a high alarm on the both the front motor, motor front and the motor rear, and the motor rear, of course, whenever we took it apart, we found a broken fan, and uh, the motor front. This is what's interesting on the motor front is we still these are sealed bearings. Uh, we have lots and lots of drives here at our plant that. We there's nothing we can do with. All we can do is monitor it and replace it whenever it starts to go bad. There is no grease fittings or anything in them. And anything named Sumitomo or So Eurodrive, um, those things, they pretty much none of them have grease fittings on them. So they're all sealed bearings like this. Uh, we have these. Cut this bearing in part. And there's absolutely no grease, no nothing on half of this bearing. There's only a couple of elements in this bearing right here that have grease on them. It's not packed, but it's but there's a little bit of grease on them. So it's interesting to see the whenever an ultrasound alarm goes high, you want to know. Sometimes you want to know why, even though you you know sometimes you can't find out why because you have to send it out for repair. It's a high high end motor or something, but in this case, we took this one apart, cut it apart, and found out what the problem is. Uh, this was a two-hour repair; would have been a two-hour repair at a at a cost savings of of one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. Here's one for antifreeze pump that that we found with ultrasound. Of course. Uh, we had a little slack time where we didn't have any technicians running ultrasound, so there was about a year here in this chart where there were no readings being taken. Uh, and so, but whenever we did finally get people again, uh, we took readings and we caught this one just before it went out. Uh, you can see the easily see the damage in this bearing right here and this particular pump uh, could have potentially uh, shut down the whole plant because this is a feed pump that feeds antifreeze to our final lines which would could shut down the whole a whole system which uh, uh, actually it could shut down all three systems it could shut down three systems when that total was uh, half a million dollars. If this pump would have gone out, it could have potentially cost us a half a million dollars. Um, here's one for a. Uh, here's well, it, this is another little motor and gearbox. It's a small motor and gearbox uh, that really didn't look like much, uh, and it and it's not really much, but in our in our facility, it's everything's an assembly line, so everything everything works in a line. So it's like even a small motor can cause serious serious downtime and and cost problems. Uh, the bearings on this thing went into a, as you can see they went into alarm, uh, and this this is on the motor. Now we weren't checking. The, we were not checking the gearbox, but uh, I recommended I wrote a work order and I recommended changing the whole the whole drive, uh, the whole motor and gearbox assembly, just because uh, where this was, there's no sense in just replacing the motor and the way it was built. Uh, there was a reason for that, but uh, I'm glad I did. Glad I recommend changing the whole thing uh, because whenever we finally took it apart. Finally got it changed and took it apart. Inside the gearbox, these are some of the these are the bronze gears uh, 
and you can see where half of the half of the gears were have been chewed off. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see it any better with this with this, but it's area on the area on the gear about inch and a half long, and uh, you can see the the saddles that it's cut into these gears and some of them had gotten worn down real thin so it wasn't very long and this thing was going to be spinning spinning its wheels and it's not it wasn't going to be going anywhere um, here's the metal shavings inside the oil that uh, was getting spread around the gearbox and here's also the key uh, I would imagine that that gear had been, those gears had been catching, had been jamming up a little bit and started wallowing out this, putting pressure back on the motor. And this right here is probably where we were getting the feedback into that, into the motor for those high ultrasound readings. So this is probably where that feedback was getting back into those motor bearings. Um, thing, it, when, when it, we rewrote this work order, I wrote this work order and and it was four months before maintenance got around to replacing that thing. I'm not sure, you know, I didn't ask a whole lot of questions. I'm not sure if it was because they didn't think it was all that important or if it was because they were waiting on a motor to come in or or what. But regardless, there was, uh, it was four months. So that's how long, that's how much time that Ultrasound bought us on this thing. Uh, it bought us bought us plenty of time and we uh, it let us know well in advance uh, this that that brass you can see right here or that bronze or the, off that gear you can see right here in the motor bearing where it had been uh, this is one of the motor bearings and where that bronze had not not the motor bearing it, it was, this is a gearbox bearing sorry uh, this is this is this is a bearing in the input of the gearbox where that bronze had gotten up into this bear and started started making the marks chewing up the chewing up the elements in the bearing uh, anyway did, my point is that the ultrasound for this whole thing right here was the ultrasound bought us four months of time before before we had major issues uh, we avoided two hours of downtime uh, at approximately $144,000 on this on this system, and at that we have come to an end, and I'm glad you're happy of that. So, so if you have any questions. All right, awesome, Robbie. There were lots. I think we had very engaged group. Um, so let's uh, see how many we can get through here. And if we don't get to your question, um, I'll just send them off to Robbie um, separately, and he can hook up with you offline um, to to answer anything we don't get to. So here we go. Um, one question on the points uh, that you are monitoring ultrasonically. Do you only lube? points based off of your ultrasound readings or do you still have some assets that you're doing time-based lubrication on? Well, we have a separate lubrication group in our plant, Yates Services. They they do our they do our lubrication for us and there are areas where they still do they still have their PMs. We do not have everything converted over yet to using. We have we have the newest, and we have some of the older grease caddies. Uh, I did not get into the grease caddies, but um, we do have those. And Yates has been trained on them. And whenever I write my work orders and stuff, they they use the grease caddies to go out there and lubricate the bearings. Uh, to answer your question, no, we're not completely transferred over to using strictly the uh, grease caddy yet, um, but we're getting there. It's 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 in process. 
Okay, awesome. We'll bring you back okay. to do a whole thing on yeah. lubrication for us. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, can you explain how the program complements the separate vibration program that you mentioned that you guys have? We have, uh, yes, they, we have replaced overhead conveyor drives or different pieces of equipment. Uh, it's not just vibration. We use the we use the motor analysis. We use the infrared. We try to before I make a call and to write a work you know before I write a work order and tell people they're going to have to replace a ten thousand dollar drive. Uh, I verify it every way I can. We use we use vibration. Uh, we use ultrasound, infrared, motor analysis. We use the oil analysis, the whole works to verify as much as we can before we make that kind of before we make that kind of decision, uh, and vice versa. If something is found with uh, uh, vibration, then we're going to try our best to, vib to verify that with ultrasound, oil analysis. We're going to try to verify it another way if possible. We're going to try to uh, you know at least get to two technologies to verify that give us a clue that this thing needs to be changed out. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, great. Um, and then here, this one's a little long, but bear with me. So from 2013 to 2016, did the number of assets you had to monitor increase, or did you increase the number of monitoring points to be more effective with the same amount of assets? We in uh, no the number of assets did not really increase even though they did they did increase some but the main thing is is we got more we started out primarily in just two well originally it was just my area of the plant my end of the plant which is trim and chassis which is the largest end but they but we included more areas of the plant more areas of the plant got involved so uh so more assets were added uh, because other areas of the plants got involved. That's the reason why the number of points got so much larger. All right. Okay. That, well, hopefully that answered their question. Um, there are a few folks that were asking for, you know, the recording of this. So yeah, we d we did record this. So we'll put that on our website. A few people asking for your slides, but what I'll do is um, I'll just hook you up, Robbie, with, with some of those folks that were looking for some examples of some of your processes and things like that so that you guys can have some offline conversations and share what, you know, you're comfortable sharing and things like that. Um, but that'll be good for, for some of you guys to connect. Um, but that was pretty much the gist of the questions. I'm going to take the screen back here and run through just a couple closing slides. But again, you know, Robbie, that was a great presentation. Obviously, we had a very engaged uh, audience with the questions and everything. So I think uh, we've got some folks who are, you know, going through some of the same things that you've dealt with, and, and hopefully you've uh, provided some, some guidance. And if nothing else, um, just, you know, even just someone else that knows that they're not the only ones out there dealing with some of these things. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, just a couple quick things um, before we let everybody go. Just want to let you all know about um, two of our new um, offerings that we've got. It's our online mechanical inspection and lubrication class and our compressed air survey online course. So we're really excited about these. Um, you know, it's definitely great for folks who aren't always able to travel to a training class. Um, you know, we know those travel restrictions are sometimes an issue. So this is a great, great opportunity to, if you, these are top topics of interest for you um, to be able to at your own pace, at your own time, at your own location, sit next to the the fire, whatever, as, as we're all going to be, you know, hopefully enjoying enjoying some downtime towards the end of the year um, to sit through these classes. So we've got more information on our website, um, but uh, if those are of interest, we hope you find them to be valuable. Um, also want to make sure you guys know we've got some LinkedIn groups, um, our Ultra Probe users group. It's a great place to 
you know, get connected with people like Robbie, um, asking questions, um, sharing, you know, tips and advice, um, just a, a great place to kind of take some conversations from today's webinar offline or not really offline. Um, that's still online, but uh, you know what I mean? So uh, take advantage of those. And then we've, we're also on Twitter. We're constantly putting out articles that we think are interesting, articles that are related to ultrasound and obviously anything else to do with reliability. Um, so you can check that out and then um, save the dates. Um, all of a sudden it's the end of December almost. And so we're looking forward to, uh, to our conferences next year, May 9th through the 12th in beautiful Clearwater Beach, Florida for our ultrasound world and reliable asset world conferences. So hopefully folks can put those dates on their calendar. And um, as the weather is starting to turn very chilly here, uh, thinking about those warm, uh, warm days at the beach um, at the end of the days uh, of, of good learning, it's, it's kind of fun to think about. So we hope people can, can make plans to join us there. And with that, I'll leave our contact information up. As I said, I'll do some connecting offline um, for those of you who had some additional questions that we didn't, didn't answer on here. Um, but with that, I'll let everybody go and hope everybody has a great rest of the year. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all back here in 2017. Thanks again to Robbie, and uh, we'll see you all soon.